This video was originally going to be a joke, a long-running inside joke about the channel itself. You probably already guessed it. Just imagine scrolling over to your old pal Super Bunny Hop and seeing a fresh-baked new video titled Review, Silent Hill Pachinko. But dreams were shattered and hopes were dashed for the purposes of the whole trip because I just couldn't find the damn thing. I went to seven different patchy parlors and couldn't find a single Silent Hill machine. Apparently the idea might have been just as unpopular there as it was here. Disclaimer, what I did learn though more than anything else was that I don't get it. Pachinko is not for foreign tourists. Most signage was in Japanese, so I had to Google Translate and just kind of mash buttons to see what would happen on my way to something that's like an illiterate child's understanding of how these games work. Also, one last thing. I love you. Finding a Silent Hill machine may have been difficult, but finding a patchy parlor sure as hell was not. Japan's almost $300 billion patchy slot business is enormous, bigger than the arcades to a point where a block off the Shibuya Scramble has a patchy parlor across the street from a patchy parlor across the street from another patchy parlor. Speaking loudly or playing loud noises in public is considered really impolite in Japan. For most of the trip, me and my friend just couldn't stop gawking over how quiet the biggest, most chaotic crowds were. So imagine our surprise when we walked into a patchy parlor. I have been tossed around like a rag doll at heavy metal concerts. I have bicycled in the emergency lane of crowded interstates in the desert and a patchy parlor. The second floor of Big Apple at Akihabara was the loudest noise I have ever heard in my life. You can tell which customers know what they're doing by whether or not they're wearing earplugs, which on floor two were almost ubiquitous among the glazed regulars, stretching out of their seats, fingering a cigarette and halfway focusing on the screen. Despite these machines being outfitted as a gambling pastime for adults, the unpredictable game of pachinko itself, of just dropping balls down obstacle courses rigged with pegs, is something that's not necessarily considered an adult activity. In fact, kids are kind of weaned on this stuff from childhood. It's one of the hardest levels from Super Mario Sunshine. It's one of the first items you roll up in Katamari Damachi, and it's not uncommon to find beautifully mustard-colored vintage pachinko machines in all ages areas where you find video arcade machines. Kind of like pinball. In fact, at the turn of the 20th century, Pachinko's predecessors were originally developed as toys for kids, but market forces turned Pachinko into gambling for adults over the next century. It faced an increasing amount of regulation in terms of win rates, payouts, and age restrictions, which again is kinda like pinball's history in the US, although pinball's public association with gambling largely ended in 1976, when Roger Sharp called and then executed a perfect shot in front of New York City Councilmen, proving it is a game of skill rather than chance. But Pachinko never really had that moment, probably because players ultimately have little to no control over where their balls drop. So nowadays the game is shifting in and out of two spheres of childhood innocence against grey market adulthood vice. Patchy parlors aren't just eager to use the game to sneak through Japan's gambling law loopholes, but also to slap video game brands and anime all over the place to attract younger audiences just now coming into adulthood. A new version of Evangelion is stamped all over these machines, and so is Girls und Panzer. Girls und Panzer is super hot right now. Video game brands were kind of a minority among the machines, and I didn't see them exploit any of the artsier properties, like how Silent Hill is this postmodern, surreal David Lynch tribute, and it was nowhere to be found. The MGS3 machine isn't out yet, so that was nowhere to be found either, but what I did see were a few game brands that are kind of less subtle and more schlocky and more casual by design. Dead or Alive, Resident Evil, Devil May Cry, King of Fighters, and somehow Lost Planet 2? So the way this works is you put a bill in the machine and that really should have been a red flag right there. Arcade video games in Japan want a 100 yen coin for 5 to 10 minutes of entertainment, and patchy machines in Japan want a 1000 yen note for 5 to 10 minutes of entertainment. After putting your bills into the machine, a pile of small metal balls will come falling out onto a tray below. You pick those balls up and put them into another tray above that funnels them towards a launcher, whose strength is controlled by a spring tension lever below. You have to maintain pressure on a sweet spot in order to make sure that as many balls possible are going through the course into a prize hole in the center chamber. 
And at that point, stuff just happens. Videos play, lights flash, a slot machine might start spinning around the screen going crazy, yelling at you to smash the one and only lonely little button on the whole machine. But getting a ball into the center always rewards you with at least some kind of small payout of more balls. Balls are the currency conversion scheme of these places. You pay money for balls that you put into a machine that gives you more balls that you give to a staffer who then counts them and gives you either a printed receipt or a plastic card that you give to a prize counter that gives you a prize that you turn into money at a pawn shop across the street. <laughs> But your balls aren't going to be worth trading for anything unless you hit some kind of jackpot chance that's so rare I never hit it in the four to five hours I spent at these places, and even then, that small little minuscule reward that's supposed to keep you going is something like four to eight balls for every 14 to 15 balls it takes to get them. It's some little, bland, worthless nibble of a carrot at the end of this stick to keep players going. I was surprised to see that it's not really the pachinko machines that take up most of the space in these buildings. It's really Patchy Slot, which is just a slot machine that has none of the balls and pegs of pachinko, which is doubly weird since the Patchy prefix is an onomatopoeia that's supposed to sound like balls hitting those pegs. Pachy, pachy, pachy. In either case, the vast majority of pachinko or patchy slot machines filling up these places have a video screen attached, which ties into how video game companies have managed to video gamify this stuff. They tie a narrative into that slow drip feed of winnings. A story will be playing out on these screens, and it'll loop the same scenes over and over again and won't progress unless you win. Which, since it's gambling, is statistically not likely to happen unless you feed it more money. I guess the part where you hit the lever as sirens blare during big payouts corresponds to faster action scenes playing on the screen, but full disclosure, I wouldn't know that because I never got that far. So to know what happens to Dante and Triss here, you gotta give them a lot of money and just hope for the best. And I think that's why so many fans find the prospect of video games getting turned into pachinko to be so depressing. It's that the morals of this business occupy a darker corner than the rest of the entire video game industry. It's taking the famous names and faces of video games and applying one of the most basic, simple forms of interactive storytelling, which is play a cinematic as a reward for good gameplay, and applying it to a business model that rewards only the addicted. But what really offends me is that it's not cheap. I spent like $70 for four to five hours in the pachinko parlors and I hated it, whereas I spent the same amount of money for double the time in the arcades, even the expensive ones, and I was having the time of my life. Evidently, the whales that this industry are chasing after are more easily separated from their money than your average hardcore gamer, which is something that blows my mind. It's the thought that an industry as big as Pachinko is only for rich, gambling-addicted, old Japanese people, and maybe that's just something we'll never understand. And when you look at the kind of reporting and discussion that usually surrounds this topic, it seems like something we don't really want to understand either. In which case, I'm guilty as charged, I guess. Come